1993. And so, um, you know, and that was a good time. I was just talking to Barry about it over lunch because Barry was in the independent film showing and then later video business. Um, but now the whole streaming thing, I mean, I'll just give you an example. Back then, my first feature film, Where the Rivers Flow North, Rip Torn, Tantu Cardinal, sold 40,000 videos to video stores at 60 bucks a piece. Okay, that was the old model. Well, wow, okay, so I, you know, nearly paid back all my production costs if my foreign sales company hadn't gone bankrupt and stiffed me for $600,000. Anyway, but it sort of worked. Now you make a deal with Netflix, three-year license, for $15,000. There's no money, you know, and so, and now Netflix is sort of, you know, it, it, it sort of sets out to destroy the DVD through streaming and then destroy movie theaters mm -hmm. by doing event films straight on streaming. Mm -hmm. And yet they're losing $3 billion a year. So they're actually totally disrupting all of the models, not even knowing whether it's viable. And then because of their whole stock and you know, because of their credit worthiness and their stock sales, they have all this money to basically just throw their weight around and it's very disruptive. So for us, and it's, we're also moving just sort of aesthetically, and that's not their fault, but you know, I mean, more, more towards the series and away from the, fee, from the feature film. Yeah. And, and so, uh, and you also have young audiences that are not used to the theatrical going experience for independent film. And so media has become much of a commodity, whereas media traditionally, and it's true for independence as well, you wanted to create an event around your media. Mm -hmm. But that's much harder to do now. So, you know, the film will, it has a foreign distribution deal and, you know, who the heck knows where it'll end up there. Uh, it does not have a domestic deal right now. I haven't really shown it around a lot and I'm starting to, but I'm also making another film and I don't really have a staff and, you know, all these things happen. I mean, you can be on Amazon, maybe you're on Netflix, maybe you're not. I mean, it's also true that Netflix is much less approachable now than it used to be. Uh, even though they have this kind of monopoly where either you're there or you're not there, you know. So I'm, I'm not exactly sure what the domestic deal will be, but I do know that independent distributors are sort of also in a state of chaos right now because you have all this monopolization by Amazon, Netflix, and what's left of the studios. And there's the, the niche for the independent distributor, given that the, 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 the collapse of video stores, for example, it's just, it's very difficult. And so, I really don't know what will happen. I mean, we're showing it, um, you know, and, I, and on the other hand, I'm limited because I have to sort of go with it. Um, you know, I've got screenings coming up in Ithaca and, and uh, Lake Placid and, you know, a few places, but I also can't be totally on the road with it all the time, even less than I used to be, you know, because I'm sort of teaching and curating a film festival and, and finishing a film and trying to make another film a year from now. So. That's sort of what it is. And so then why are you making another film? That's a good question. I think I'm going to make one more film. And it's actually going to be North Country, you know, Ethan Allen, Green Mountain Boys, Benning Wentworth, the corrupt governor of New Hampshire, and sort of a multicultural view of the northern front of the American Revolution, partly because my feeling is if it's so specific to this region, it should play in the region. You know, and so that's, and I've done a lot of regional films and that's been the case of them. This film is out of left field because where is it set? You know, well, in Vermont, a lot of it. Yeah, a lot of it's in Vermont. It's in Brattleboro and, and Burlington and Nantucket, strangely enough. But the Nantucket people say, that doesn't look like Nantucket to me. <laughs> and the Vermont people say, it doesn't look like Vermont to me. <laughs> but anyway, so that's part of the deal. Yes, Are you and then. In Vermont? Excuse me? Is it being shown in Vermont? It's been shown in Vermont, yes. I mean, it's sort of touring around and, you know. I mean, the audiences for this film are not huge. Um, because Vermonters want me to show, to make my Vermont films. And this isn't a Vermont film as far as they're concerned. And then they're saying, well, why'd you do this? This is sort of scary. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't go to the movies to be scared. I go to the movies to look at the old logger, you know, from the 20s who's, you know, s stubborn and self-destructive and heroic and, you know, all those things. You but, get the opposite when you go to Massachusetts. They say, why would we want to show a film from Vermont? That's right. Sure. <laughs> sure. No, and it's like, you know, I said, the, because I've shot my last several films partly in Nantucket. I mean, I've made a picture called Peter and John and, and uh, now Bar Martin Eden. I said, so I spent the first 30 years of my involvement, you know, trying to convince people in southern New England that northern New England was rele relevant. Mm 
And now I'm trying to convince northern New England that s southern New England is relevant. Yes? Uh, you dedicated it to Marlboro College, and I wonder if you could just talk for a moment about what's going on in Marlboro College. Marlboro, very sadly, you know, is basically thrown in the towel, and it's, it's very unhappy. I mean, I taught there for 20 years. I developed this program at Marlboro. I'm currently teaching at Sarah Lawrence College, and the film I shot last spring I did through Sarah Lawrence. Um, Marlboro's a fabulous little school, and if I were to be honest and frank about it, you know, the, the leadership, I mean, the, the enrollment declined from 300 to about 150 over a period since 19, 2009, basically since the financial downturn in 2009. Mm -hmm. And what that requires is a, is a bold kind of leadership that's willing to sort of rethink everything. And unfortunately, a new president came in that, in my opinion, was just trying to work the old model, and the old model wasn't working. Mm -hmm. And so they basically announced about a month or six weeks ago that they were going to give $30 million endowment and their $12 million campus to Emerson College. Mm -hmm. But a number of alumni, in fact, the former faculty, are not happy about that, especially the campus. Just feeling that, you know, if the college is going to throw in the towel, fine, I guess. Although some would say $30 million is enough money to figure something out and that it just has mm -hmm. to be rethought. Because there are a lot of schools operating, like Bennington College and others that don't, and Hampshire don't have 30 million, you know. But they've spent, they had a $50 million endowment. 10 years ago. And so they're spending it down, and so they've announced that this will be the last year uh, of the college. And then what they did, after I was, sh I was actually shooting wetware the last week of the shoot, and I got a call from the dean of faculty who said that, you know, we're eliminating the retirement benefit for faculty. But for you and the other six senior faculty, if you'll, if you'll go now, we'll give you the, the retirement benefit. And so six out of the seven of us said, fine, you know, partly because of the way it was offered. And we had two weeks to make a decision. And it just seemed like, is this really the way we should be? You know, this is a small college with, you know, 32 faculty, and you're taking seven faculty off the top and, and before you've even thought through what you're playing. You know, it just didn't seem right, but we did it. Partly because if it would help the college, you know, I don't know. It's just been, it's been, an, un it's been an unhappy situation. It was a very special place. Uh, really engaged in learning this I mean supported this project mm -hmm. not financially because I, I had to do the work but they were totally behind it mm -hmm. and you know it involved us with another 20 colleges you know that got involved in one way or another mm -hmm. I mean it's Wellesley Mount Holyoke University of California at Berkeley mm -hmm. Skidmore Hamilton Bates you know these are good schools they're all very enthusiastic the pro this program is actually growing Sarah Lawrence is thrilled with it, you know, and, and, and they, there was not even a thing about let's sit down and talk about how this program might tell us a few things about other things that we could be doing mm -hmm. in experiential learning, you know, because the political science teacher loved this, said, oh, political experiential learning, I'm going to do an experiential semester where my kids focus on speech writing, and we go to Montpelier, and we go to Washington, and they start writing speeches, you know, and all this, and, and it was great. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I don't know, that's my short too long version of what's happening at Marlboro, but thank you for that. Um, I'm I'm sorry about it because I really love Marlboro. Um, yeah. Is is there something you can suggest that a way we can support independent films? Well, you know, going to see them and circulating your friends. I mean, you know, we could get into a long discussion about independent film. You know, because it's also true. Harvey Weinstein sort of pioneered, sort of created a little bit of a detour for independent film. Because independent film was coming alive through Sundance and everything else, all of a sudden Harvey Weinstein started th throwing a lot of money into the specialty film with huge stars and frankly big budgets as the sort of new independent film. You know, but a, but a $40 million film with Gwyneth Paltrow and, you know, is not really the same as what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And so it sort of eclipsed, you know, what was a, a sort of independent spirit, including an independent spirit in the region. You know, so for us, the whole deal was staying in northern New England and not going to L.A. or New York and being, you know, and to try to keep saying we can make, uh, we, can, we can create an independent cinema culture here, including a sci-fi film, you know, whatever. Uh, but that, you know, so I think you just support the work and, and uh, try to know about it and uh, support a theater like this, which, you know, gets it out. And uh, because these independent theaters are also threatened to a significant degree. 
And so they need community support to keep them alive so that people can continue to come together in physical space and not just consume media as a commodity. Mm -hmm. You know? They're struggling hard. Mm -hmm. They are struggling hard. Um, and they've undergone several transitions of ownership. They've dropped a film festival they were doing. Uh, the Nugget Theater in Hanover is struggling. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's just, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a time of many transitions. And, and again, media, we we'll just go back, you know, the future. This is the future of media, which is lots of it, consumed nickel and dime at the drop of a hat, but you get, it's hard to talk to your friends about what they've seen because everybody's watching something different. The Bellows Falls still packs the house. Uh-huh. At five dollars a ticket. Yeah. Yeah, I should Which go down to Bellows Falls with this picture. It's, uh, I was in Putney the night before last, and that was fun. I had 110 people to watch Peter and John, the movie I made just before this one. Uh -huh. and, and, and that was great. You know, and, and then the, the, old, the, the guy running it said, you know, this crowd doesn't have TV. <laughs> I said, wow, yeah, yeah. that's unusual. Yeah. You, you had some interesting visual effects in there. I was curious how, how you came with some surreal, surrealistic sort of, you know, yeah. probing. I, uh, I love the poetry of the cars. things. Where, where did that come from? And they were really interesting. Uh, well, I mean. Sort of Lynchian. Yeah, right. <laughs> Which I, you know. Um, now, well, there's there the cars, you know, I which was done cars. by a friend of mine who I've worked with since 1970. He was a, a documentary, he was one of the founders of Newsreel, lives in Burlington now, John Douglas. Um, and so he did the car thing, and I, it was, I saw it after I shot the film, and I said, I, I, sometimes I do bring other non-diegetic materials into my films. I've done this on several movies, and I said, this, I think, is just sort of a reprise. And so every, every other screening besides this one, the first question is, what do the cars mean? Mm -hmm. To which I say, well, what do you think they mean? Mm -hmm. And somebody finally says, climate change. I said, yeah, okay, fine, take that, or whatever you want it to be. But also the cars, I mean, Jean-Luc Godard's weekend has the traffic jam at the beginning. Fellini's eight and a half has the traffic jam at the beginning. Traffic jams in, in sort of movies is sort of, you know, a commonplace almost. I mean, it's, it's appeared. So that, so that style of animation was his. The, the uh, scene in the sort of opium den gaming parlor, which is really pretty whimsical and pretty out there, uh, young kid straight out of RISD, you know, Rhode Island mm -hmm. School of Design, who I just said, you know, because the alternative to that was doing a video game that was fairly literal to the video games we know. And I, and I, I said, it doesn't really interest me, number one. Number two, it's going to cost $50,000. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, this kid said, well, I have some ideas about the future. And I, and I said, well, show me, and he showed me like 15 seconds. And I said, it's fabulous. <laughs> and for five grand, he did it, you know. Yeah. And so I just said, do it. And it's totally sort of inconsistent with the visual aesthetic of the rest of the film, but I, that didn't bother me. Because right, you're inside the bubble. You're right? inside the bubble. Yeah. And, and it, well, the idea, and then we called it a neural feedback interface. Mm -hmm. People say, what the hell's that? Well, that's another technology that is developing, which is the ability of technology to figure out what you're thinking. You know, and they're already at the point where somebody with serious handicaps can approach a door and say, I want the door to open, and the door opens. So the idea is, it's almost a Jungian concept of a technology that is responding to your unconscious, to a certain extent. I mean, it's a little bit out there, it's not fully explained or done anything else. But, you know, the guy who loses, loses because the, the system sort of goes south on him. Because what it's reading on his neurological feedback is just going down, 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 you know, I wouldn't do that if I were you, you know, blah, 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 bang, you know. And so that was sort of the idea there as a, as a visual effect. And we sort of just went with it as a kind of quasi-experimental, you know, visualization of that. Um, otherwise, you know, the screens became a way for us to continue to develop some narrative content after we shot the film. Because we just started seeing stuff in the film that we wanted to work with this way instead of the way it was originally intended. So then that involves creating the screens and distorting the screens sometimes and just showing also technology as inconsistent. Mm -hmm. So weak signal, you know, it comes up mm -hmm. on the screen. Like weak signal, so the whole thing's going a little haywire. Well, that's the way 
Signals work in my house. <laughs> you know, it's so funky. And they will so work forevermore. Huh? There will always be a weak signal. There will always somewhere. be a weak signal or a non-existent <laughs> signal. I'm, I'm trying to download a, a, my, a, a new cut of my film on Vimeo right now. It's taken me three days so far, and I'm not getting anywhere with it. I'm going to have to get in my car and probably drive to Dartmouth College and hang out for 12 hours <laughs> while it downloads, you know. Anyway, so I was sort of, that was that idea. Uh, Carr, the character of Carr. I mean, the other thing that I found is sort of a, an element, sort of socially or culturally, is the notion of the transactional relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, Carr to me is the quintessential transactional character. She's not good or bad. She just does what she sees it, she sizes it up, and she does it, right? And it's not like, you know, what are you talking about, right or wrong, or good or bad? And again, we're hearing that in Washington right now. What do you mean good? What do you mean this is bad? What do you mean it's wrong? It's, like, it's not wrong. It's good. It's bad. It's, you know, it's all this relativism and sort of transactional relationship to get what you need to get. And so that sort of interested me also as something I just see happening more and more. And so that to me is a kind of futuristic behavior that's already sort of in place. You know, but anyway. Um, so, the, so, so Carr was worked in the post-production to sort of sharpen that element of her character. And that includes then the use of screens to help that along. Uh, so if you're making a near future film, you can, you can rely on some technology after to, to let you, allow you to keep thinking about it, which is harder to do in a, in a more traditional narrative. All right, well thank you very much for coming. Thank you Barry for having me here and I really appreciate your you know, taking the time.